WCON 1170 Radio and Star Vision Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. The name of the show is We Should Know. A lot going on today. We're coming to you on WCLN 1170 Radio, Star Vision TV, Star Vision Cable Channel, uh, Star Vision uh, Cable Channel 16. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 7 p.m. Tuesdays, 2.30 to 3.30, just reprint the Sampson Weekly newspaper. Got a lot to talk about today. We're, we're talking about a lot of the issues. The legislature is finally adjourned, and we've got the uh, district attorney for the 4th Prosecutorial District here in North Carolina, Ernie Lee. Ernie, a lot of folks know your name. Uh, they, <clears throat> Fortunately, they, maybe they don't know your face that much because hopefully they haven't been before you in court. Uh, but there's been a lot going on with the legislature, a lot of issues that's been, uh, I guess, levied. There's a lot of, obviously, objection that has been seen in Raleigh. And we, a lot of folks have seen on the TV, you know, a couple hundred people or ever how many shows up to object to a lot of things that happened. But one of the most uh, profound things that seems to have occurred that, that uh, I think we needed to address and that literally I want you to talk about is the uh, whole issue of uh, deadly force mm -hmm. and the idea that all of us have a right of self-defense. Right. And with North Carolina, we have, like some other states, I understand, something that is referred to as the Castle Law. Mm -hmm. um, if you could, let's talk about that for a minute because you are the guy, and I'll kind of make this uh, an observation up front, you're the guy that if something happens and, and a case is investigated, uh, the district attorney is the person that determines if it comes to trial, That's right. if it is prosecuted, i.e., right. you are the prosecutor. So it's, it falls in, in your lap to determine, make that determination. So let's talk about the Castle Law in North Carolina, what its impacts are, and, and what are some of the things that a person is allowed to do, and when are they allowed to use deadly force. And then I want to kind of get specific and talk a little bit about the national case, like everybody else seems to have talked about. So sure. I figured we should talk about it too. So I want to give you the podium for that. Absolutely. Well, again, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I always enjoy your show. Uh, the Castle Doctrine is uh, really stems out of our self-defense statutes here in North Carolina. Um, as you well if you just said, we have the right to defend ourselves against death or serious bodily injury in the state. That's pretty much around the nation. That is the, it's, it's from the common law brought over from England. We do have the right to defend ourselves and others from death or serious bodily injury. Our legislature, though, has actually enacted something called the Castle Doctrine which basically says that anyone who is lawfully in their home and has been extended to their motor vehicle or to their workplace, you have the right to defend yourself from someone who unlawfully intrudes upon those places. So they've actually extended it from just the general self-defense to actually include the home. Now, why do they call it the castle doctrine? Because everyone's home is presumed to be their castle. But the legislatures extend the definition of castle to motor vehicles and to the workplace. So in fact, you can use deadly force to defend yourselves and others from death or imminent bodily injury. Uh, I've had to deal with this. You, you mentioned that ultimately the DA is the one who actually has to address these things if there is in fact a shooting somewhere in this district. I have four <coughs> counties, Sampson, Duplin, Onslow, and Jones. Almost every week there's something going on somewhere I have to deal with. I've actually had to deal, though, with three serious cases involving deadly force. I had to deal with those in Onslow County. And my job as district attorney is to gather the facts from law enforcement, read over the statements, and determine whether or not death, excuse me, that, uh, that the use of force was justified. And that is my job to do. Now, you're always subject to criticism for every decision you make. Um, I'm prepared to talk about some of the ones I dealt with in Onslow County because I think they would really shed a lot of light on that. In fact, I had two in Onslow County in April 2012 that occurred with one week of each other. One of which was an individual, three individuals who in fact um, lived at a residence. Two individuals broke into that residence. Two Marines and a civilian came home that night. The two individuals who broke in were still inside the residence. Uh, while they were there, the three uh, occupants came home. The two individuals who broke in had a shotgun. They threatened the lives of all three individuals. They tied them up and threatened to kill them. One of the Marines was able to get, a, get away, was able to gain control of the shotgun and shoot both of the intruders. Okay? 
That case, though, uh, really took on sort of a life of its own in Onslow County because um, I had some people saying that, that uh, murder had occurred. Mm -hmm. In fact, I found it was not a murder. In fact, these people were simply exercising self-defense and defense of their residence. Mm -hmm. I used the do a castle doctrine because these people were intruders who broke in. They were unlawfully there. They were in the uh, trying to burglarize that home. They, in fact, had threatened the three occupants of that home, tied them up, and threatened their lives with death. And therefore, I found that these people were justified in using deadly force in killing both the intruders. Now, I can tell you I met with the, victim, excuse me, the families of the intruders, and uh, they were insistent that it was murder. Mm -hmm. They were insistent that it was murder. But I explained the law to them, my findings, and I actually had a press conference over there and indicated it was justifiable. Mm -hmm. I had another case over in Onslow, it actually happened um, over in the Hubert area, where an individual, was a Marine, was high on bath salts uh, and other types of uh, narcotics. Mm -hmm. He, in fact, uh, was walking around the streets with no clothes on, that uh, was making threatening gestures, uh, making threatening statements to others, went up to a residence. Inside the residence was a Marine, his wife, and young child. The Marine inside the residence got his weapon, and he told the individual outside, do not come inside, stay out. At some point, the individual outside dove through the window, the living room window. As he dove through the window, the occupant of the home shot him and killed him. I had that one investigated by the SBI as well. And I also determined that one there was also the Castle Doctrine applied and that the, uh, the shooting was justified, that deadly force was justifiable. Why? Because the occupant of this home was in fear for himself and his family, wife and young child. Therefore, he was justified in using lawful, excuse me, using deadly force. And here's one thing about our statute on this. The statute says, and it's actually 14-51.2, it's right after the burglary statutes. And it says that a person who unlawfully and by force enters or attempts to enter a person's home, motor vehicle, or workplace is presumed to be doing so with the intent to commit an unlawful act involving force or violence. Therefore, if you break into someone's home, the presumption is that you are doing so for some unlawful act. Mm -hmm. The presumption is against you on that. Because again, you're trying to protect someone's home, their castle. In both those cases in Onslow County, I found it was justified. And, and the, I think the key phrase, uh, Ernie, is the unlawfully enters. That's right. That, and because I'm, I'm listening to both of these cases. <coughs> and the second case, as you refer to, uh, the individual apparently was not mm -hmm. armed that, that entered the home. Right. Uh, app apparently he had some kind of uh, mental problem due, due sure. to the use of uh, uh, illegal substances in, the, in his body. So he, he propels his body through the window, was not armed. And then the, the, the uh, occupant of the home took his life. So justifiable in the sense that he was not asked to enter. He forced himself That's in. Right. So the doctrine fell to play and, and he can, a person could actually take his life. And, and move forward from there. And that's right, because in that particular case, even though this intruder was not armed, the fact is this intruder still broke through the window. He actually ran and jumped through the window um, head first. And he just went through the window. But of course, the person inside the home doesn't know what this person is going to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What if he were to jump up all of a sudden and start you know, doing something, attacking the wife, attacking the mm -hmm, child, mm -hmm. attacking the, the Marine? I mean, you don't know what he's going to Just do. Just because a person does not have a weapon as such in their hand does not necessarily mean they're not dangerous or deadly to someone else. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, 26 year, over 26 years as a prosecutor, mm -hmm. I've had numerous cases where someone was high, either on meth or some other, or bath salts mm -hmm. or some other type of controlled substance, and they are not in their right minds. Mm -hmm. And in fact, sometimes it seems like they had extra strength they normally wouldn't have. And they would do acts they normally wouldn't do. And therefore, even though they didn't have a weapon, they were certainly a threat to others around mm -hmm. them. Because mm -hmm. I've had some people pretty high on meth who seem to become like super strength or have super strength and do some acts that you wouldn't expect they would do. And so in this particular case, this Marine inside the residence, all he knows is, look, there's somebody out there making threats, yelling, acting a little bit crazy. Next thing you know, he's diving through my window. I have a wife and child here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he chose, justifiably so, to take the life of the intruder. 
So, <clears throat> so what we hear, what we hear, hearing you say then, if we look at these cases in reality, each case takes on its own personality. So, mm -hmm. when you review these cases, unlike the statute, when you re read the statute, it's kind of uh, cut and dry. Sure. But each case has its own personality. It just, you can't really just say, well, this is evidential fact in this case. It might be different in another case depending on what the situation was or might have been. Absolutely. Every case stands on its own. I do it on a case-by-case -case basis because just because I say this is justifiable may mean another one's not justifiable mm -hmm. because every case stands on its own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, generally what I have to do is I, the SBI, I'll call the SBI in to investigate. The SBI will, ga uh, will gather witnesses statements. In both those cases, I had numerous statements to look at. Mm -hmm. They'll gather witnesses' statements. I also look at the physical evidence. Mm -hmm. I looked at a lot of photographs in both those cases. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I look at all those things, and of course, I apply those facts to the law to make my decision. Mm -hmm. And I don't do this in a vacuum either. I will actually, I'll talk to my fellow assistant DAs, those who work for me. Mm -hmm. I will talk to law enforcement, but ultimately it's the district attorney who has to make the decision on this, mm -hmm. and I'll do, and that's what I did in both these cases. Now, obviously, there's going to be some people out there to say that, well, for example, in the Marine who dove through the window did not have a weapon, therefore why did this person have the right to shoot them? Mm -hmm. There was some criticism on that one. But still, applying the law, the way our legislature's passed it, and the facts in that particular case, I found it to be justifiable. Um, and, you know, you look at it this way, too. Let's say if you had charged that Marine with homicide of that person who dove through the window, well, the presumption is already against the state because the presumption, if you unlawfully enter someone's residence, that the person does have the right to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we would have had a very, very difficult case to prove that because I've got the burden of proof in every case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think under those circumstances, under both those cases, a jury would have said not guilty. Absolutely. We're going to come back and talk some more. We're going to take our first break. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with District Attorney Ernie Lee. Uh, you're watching or listening to We Should Know, a show that comes on weekly, 2.30 to 3.30 on Tuesday. We're talking about various issues that have come out of the legislature this year, 2013, that we'll be dealing with in the coming year. So stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, the name of the show is We Should Know, WCLN 1170 Radio, Star Vision TV, Channel 16, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7 p.m. Tuesdays, uh, 2.30 to 3.30. And repeats is 7 p.m. Also a summation of the Samson Weekly <coughs> newspaper. Shout out to all those folks that listen to the show out there and also the folks that have other programs that you may be listening to that gives us a, uh, a hint of recognition there each week. And that includes uh, Don Smith with the country store that precedes this show, uh, Tommy the Fly, Robert Stroud with the Boogie Shoes Radio Network there on Saturday afternoon. Appreciate all of his comments. The uh, folks at the morning show, uh, Old Man, uh, Grandpa, Nolan Z, all of those folks. Uh, Wayne Weeks with the Gospel Hour, we appreciate your comments as well. And we thank you for tuning in today. Also, remember, if you'd like to give us some comments or suggestions on programs and more information about things you'd like to know about on this show, just email us at we should know edu at gmail.com. We should know edu at gmail.com. We're talking today with District Attorney Ernie Lee of the 4th Prosecutorial District. Ernie, you've got over 26 years of experience. Uh, time goes by fast. Uh, relatively young man, but you put in a lot of time. And what a lot of folks don't know about you, you've dedicated the majority of all those years to the prosecution and to the District Attorney's Office, which is a, a huge task within itself. Uh, you've a background in the military, mm -hmm. uh, the judge advocate court, the JAG officer. Uh, somewhat, if somebody wanted to look at it, would say an exemplary record in the process of, of law and adjudication in North Carolina. Yeah, I've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I actually started with the DA's office back in January 1987. And uh, when I first started with the DA's office, I thought maybe I might be there just for a few years, maybe go to another area mm -hmm. of the state, still be a prosecutor just somewhere else. But I really enjoy this part of North Carolina. And, uh, and I'm so glad I stayed because after 24 years of serving as an assistant DA, I had the, um, the privilege of being elected the district attorney, mm -hmm. and I've, I've truly enjoyed my job. Um, I'm also a judge advocate in the United States Army Reserve. Um, I'm getting near my, my time finishing that. Yeah. I'll be retiring very shortly. But I've had some really great experiences with that. Um, ironically, though, even though I'm a prosecutor in my civilian job, in my military, I've been assigned to defense. 
quite a bit. So I've had to defend, uh, I've been assigned to defend quite a few soldiers on different drug offenses and things like that through the years. So I've had uh, to do that as well. But I think in saying that, it's given me a lot of perspectives on both sides. Mm-hmm. It's given me a lot of perspectives on both sides. And, uh, and I think it's actually made me a better prosecutor by having to defend some soldiers for criminal offenses. Well, one of the things I've, I've heard you say many times, of course, I've, I've known you for quite a while as a good friend. I've heard you make the statement that one of the things that you have pleasure out of is, is seeking justice for people, that's right. for victims. And, and I think that's what the, the underlying word in all of our conversation is, is that word justice and what justice means and bringing justice and, and some civility to a world that seems to be in chaos quite often. Absolutely, because my job as a prosecutor is not simply to prosecute cases and seek convictions. That is not my job. My job is actually to seek justice. Mm -hmm. And justice comes in many forms. Sometimes justice does mean the death penalty. Sometimes it means life without parole. Sometimes justice, though, means probation. Sometimes it means a dismissal. Mm -hmm. Uh, My job is to seek justice. And, uh, and I take that uh, very seriously. I ingrain that in all my assistant DAs, too. I always ask them, you know, we'll, we'll sit around, we'll talk about cases in all four of my counties. And we'll go through the law, we'll go through the facts, and ultimately we'll say, what is the right thing to do? Mm-hmm. Because ultimately we've got to make sure that justice is done. Mm-hmm. And my job is to make sure that some innocent person is not convicted. And if I tell you, if we have doubts, we're not proceeding with a case. If we have doubts in a case, we are not proceeding with it which means sometimes guilty people may get away. But it's my job to make sure that justice is done. I want to make sure that no innocent person is actually convicted in any of my courts in this district. We can, we can only hope that, that all of our prosecutors throughout the United States have that same uh, mindset when, it, when they walk into the courtroom, uh, that justice is actually done. And, and I, feel, I feel as they do. Uh, obviously, there's cases that we've discovered in, in North Carolina and other mm-hmm. states uh, that have kind of slipped through the cracks. And due to DNA, we've discovered that a dismissal was in place. But uh, ultimately, I think folks uh, have their heart in the right place. And absolutely, even if you find those cases where maybe DNA clears somebody from years ago, you've got then as district attorney to make the decision, which is sometimes a tough decision, because some of the public out there are still saying, look, this person may have still done it, yeah. but if DNA shows otherwise, we have to make that decision, which means that person is let out. And that's a tough decision sometimes, but, um, but you have to do what is right. And again, if, uh, if the physical evidence comes back and exonerates that person, the person ought to be let out, which means the DA has to make that, that decision. And you know, I, I, a lot of it is just, um, one of my philosophies too is, is just to treat everyone like you want to be treated. In other words, be professional, courteous, polite to all persons at all times. And uh, it includes defendants, victims, witnesses, law enforcement, court personnel. Everyone we deal with, just be professional with them. Because there's a lot of, you mentioned that uh, sometimes I think there is some civility that's lacking sometimes mm-hmm. in the criminal justice system. And, uh, and I, I always just try to be nice and polite and professional to everyone. Because that's the, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And I would hope that person would s- show the same respect for me. Absolutely. We're talking about, and one of the big issues, as, as everybody knows, and prior to going to break, we were talking about this. I want to kind of extend this conversation as it relates to the Castle Doctrine here in North Carolina, mm-hmm. uh, other states, and, and just we'll touch on shortly uh, some things that ha- have happened and got some uh, attention nationally. Sure. But as we look at this, it, the interesting thing with, with you over the period of years, you've had the opportunity to actually prosecute, and in a number of cases that, that you've already mentioned too, to not prosecute mm-hmm. based on death, based on a, the Castle Doctrine, based on best basic self-defense issues. Right. So t- two of those cases we've talked about, there was, but there was another case you wanted to mention that I think is uh, interesting as well mm-hmm. that uh, also adds some gravity to this and maybe helps folks understand a bit more about what the intent of this law is. Well, I swore in as uh, district attorney on January 1st of 2011, February 17th, 2011, about five or six weeks after I swore in as DA, There was a shooting over in Swansboro, North Carolina, which, of course, is part of Onslow County. And uh, we had an individual over there who had taken um, a couple of weapons from his residence, was walking up and down the streets of Swansboro in his neighborhood, and he was shooting in the air, making statements that were considered to be threatening of a threatening nature. There was an off-duty officer who had just arrived home. This officer was a former, was a reserve deputy with the Onslow County Sheriff's Office. He also um, uh, worked with the... um, uh, it was the Marine Corps Police Academy East in Wilmington, North Carolina, training officers in the use of force. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, little did he know mm-hmm. this very day after working with other officers, he was going to face this very situation. As he got home, he heard shooting outside. 
He got his 9 millimeter service weapon. He got his flashlight. He walked outside into the streets. He saw this individual walking with a gun, actually a couple of firearms on him. He was shooting in the air. Of course, this is a crowded neighborhood, children in this neighborhood. The officer, I think, exercised extraordinary restraint because he kept yelling to the individual, Stop, Sheriff's Office, put your weapon down, sir. Mm -hmm. And this was supported by other witnesses out there. The officer, officer exercised extraordinary restraint. He actually stood there. The person with the weapon approached the officer close enough that the officer was actually struck with the weapon. With the, with the, he swung the weapon. Personal contact. With personal weapon. contact. The officer <laughs> fell back as the person stood there, and in his mind, the person was got to shoot him. He then shot the individual, shot him several times, killing him. Now, obviously, most people say, well, that's clear cut. It's clear cut. Obviously, the officer is exercising self-defense. Of course, the SBI still has to investigate it. Swansboro Police mm -hmm. Department is involved in this. The SBI is involved. And um, that uh, after all the investigation was done, which meant interviewing all the witnesses out there, interviewing the, uh, the, the person's wife, um, interviewing all these people, looking at the physical evidence, the number of shots fired and things like that, whether or not the weapons were functioning properly, all those type things that uh, based upon all that, I determined that this was justifiable in using deadly force against this person. Frankly, the officer probably, in all likelihood, could have shot sooner if he had desired to. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. actually held off to the last moment, to the point he was actually struck himself, right. because he was trying to avoid shooting this individual. He was hoping this individual would actually put down those weapons. The individual chose not to. As a result of this, the officer was justified in shooting him. Because first of all, the officer himself had been struck. He had fallen down. Thankfully for the officer, he was able to keep his gun. What if his gun had gone off into the distance? He would have been there pretty much defenseless at that point, and the person could have shot him. But he kept his gun in his hand and then shot the person as he's laying there. Um, the person did, in fact, die um, of the gunshot wounds. It was a very difficult case for the uh, for the decedent's family. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. As a matter of fact, I had to deal with his family in terms of his mother. Because one of the things, no matter who these people are, they generally still got a mother and father mm -hmm. out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And his mother called me repeatedly about this. But, uh, you know, I explained the law to her in my findings. And I didn't make a rush decision on even this one. Um, this happened on February 17th. I did not release it until April 6th. Because I wanted to make sure it was an absolute thorough investigation. I did these in all three of these cases we've talked about. Um, sometimes people want me to go ahead and make the quick call right then. I want to make sure the facts are investigated first before I do so. And in all three of these cases, I found they were justified. And, and the interesting thing, and I <coughs> say this in all three of the cases we've discussed today, um, <clears throat> is this idea that you have to apply it to the law. That's right. You know, you, you, your opinion, uh, and based on whether it's justification or not, uh, also has to be applied to the law. All of that evidence gathered applied to the law as the law is written. So, and again, you know, th there's a certain sense of, I guess, a civic understanding of responsibility. The judicial process and the judicial branch has that responsibility of evidential standards sure. uh, rather than just what the general public thinks or what the media spin is. So oh, yeah. each one of these cases clearly uh, fell in the purview of application of law and judicial understanding and respect to evidence. Oh, absolutely, because, you know, I'm not to be swayed by public opinion. I'm not to be swayed by what people may think out there. I've got to make my decisions upon the facts and the law, because, first of all, I've got to remain objective in these particular cases. I've got to look at these as I step into it, not come any type of preconceived notions, just look at the facts, look at the law, and apply those. And, uh, and sometimes I'm going to make decisions that are not uh, particularly popular. I'm going to make those type of decisions, but I cannot be persuaded simply by public opinion. We're going to take a, another break. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with District Attorney Ernie Lee about use of force, about the uh, Castle Doctrine here in North Carolina, and uh, how he applies that here in the 4th District. We'll be back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You're all watching We Should Know on... Uh, Star Vision TV, Channel 16, 2.30 to 3.30 on Tuesday, WCLN Radio, also simulcast, as well as 7 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday 
uh, there's a replay of this uh, show, so in case you miss it, you can uh, tune us in there. One of the things that I need to mention to folks, too, is this show is uploaded to YouTube, so no matter where you are, if you want to pull this show up and look at it, just type in We Should Know EDU to pull up a number of our shows. It's already been uploaded to YouTube, and you can take a look at it as well. There's a reprint in the Sampson Weekly newspaper. We're talking with District Attorney Ernie Lee. Uh, Ernie, you're uh, district Attorney, Fourth Prosecutorial District. We've talked about a number of issues today. We talked about the Castle Doctrine here in North Carolina, uh, and actually applied some of the cases that you've uh, been involved in, and quite a number of those cases. And uh, you've also been involved in cases that have had national attention brought to them as well. And, and I want to toss now, uh, kind of move to another uh, situation that everybody's aware of. I think everybody in the media and uh, that has any expertise in human behavior has commented an observation on the George Zimmerman, uh, Trayvon Martin case in Florida. And uh, one of the things I want you to, to uh, touch on for us and, and give us a feel for and, and the importance of is its impact, this case in Florida, that's gained such national attention. Uh, what is the impact of this case on the judiciary, on the, on the prosecution part, on the whole process as we know as law and courts? You know, I think a lot of people, once the decision was reached by that jury, they were very critical of that decision. Uh, they didn't agree with it. They criticized the decision. Some were very adamant and outspoken about that decision of the jury. But, you know, I think that just simply undermines our entire criminal justice system when you do that. Because whether or not you agree with the decision or not, it is still the decision of the jury. And that jury was picked by the defense, picked by the state, passed on both, by both. They were deemed to be fair, objective, reasonable jurors. Um, the jury made a decision, which is the way the law in Florida was set up. You have six jurors down there, we have 12 in North Carolina. Those six jurors, though, made a unanimous decision. And it just, it does trouble me when people then become so outspokenly critical of the uh, decision of the jury. Because, look, that is our justice system. Um, it's the same way in North Carolina. We have 12 jurors here. But jurors have to make the decision. Our system is that we let juries, if we cannot settle a case, whether civilly or criminally with a plea agreement, if we cannot settle it in some way, it will go to the jury. Mm -hmm. And we've got to have confidence that the system will work. And I think it, it just concerns me a lot as a prosecutor when people are so very much outspoken and criticizing openly the juror's decision. Because look, one thing about it is, we sitting out here, we weren't actually in the courtroom hearing all the evidence like they were. We're hearing snippets of the evidence. We are hearing uh, what is being placed out by the press. We're not actually hearing all the evidence. Whether or not you agree with the decision or not, the jurors actually are the ones who heard all the admissible evidence. They heard it all. And I understand they, they uh, deliberated over 16 hours in this case. Mm -hmm. That is a very long deliberation, mm -hmm. uh, very long deliberation. So I think you've got to have confidence in the jury system and the justice system as a whole. You may not agree with it every time, but it's still the best system that's ever been devised by man on this earth. Right. And I think we have to have uh, confidence in the system. One of the things that when I look at this case, and I think what clearly comes out, and we, we spent a, a portion of this show uh, earlier talking about the, the Castle Doctrine in North Carolina, how it's applied, what it means. Apparently, uh, prior to e even this case, there were folks that apparently didn't understand what that Castle Doctrine was in Florida. That's right. uh, but as it played out, and as that doctrine played out, based on the evidential facts in the courtroom, as you just indicated, it unfolded into a, a whole other understanding of that. And the jurors, what's interesting with that case, is now the jurors, after the case has been adjudicated, is being questioned and media attention is being applied to jurors and what their opinion was. Uh, one juror uh, was alleged uh, on one of the CNN reports that maybe they were confused or, or they didn't understand how does that affect the judicial process? I mean, have you had cases where uh, jurors start talking to the media after the case, and, and does that, is that affecting negatively the judicial process? I've had it a couple of times in cases. I've tried over 230-some jury trials through the years, and I, in some cases I've had, had the, uh, some jurors actually speak out. Um, it doesn't surprise me where one of the jurors may have said, I was a little bit confused in the law. Well, 
I also understand that case, though, that in the Florida case, that the jurors kept sending questions out and the judge was re-instructing on the law, actually. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they only heard it one time. Mm -hmm. They first of all heard it explained by the defense and the prosecution during closing arguments. And then I understand the judge actually explained the law several times by reading it to them several times. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in saying that, even if a juror thought they were somewhat confused at this time, apparently at the time they made the decision they weren't so confused. Mm -hmm because they reached the decision with the other five jurors at that time and made a decision. Um, you know, I'm always hesitant, uh, you know, when it always causes me some concern too when jurors start saying things after the fact, mm -hmm. after the fact, because then how are they being guided maybe by public opinion? Exactly. Because I'm, we can only assume that when these jurors are back there basing their decision, they're based upon the facts that they've heard and applying the law as provided by mm -hmm. the judge. Again, they deliberated 16 hours in this case. That is a very long time. They may have talked about this law back there. I'm sure they did. But ultimately, they found the verdict they found. All 12, excuse me, all six of them found this verdict. And, um, you know, again, I'm always a little bit hesitant when jurors start coming out after the fact because I always wonder how much they've been, maybe, uh, how much public opinion has come into play at that point. With a lot of things that's going on in, in media now, and in this case is an example, example of that, and, and we're seeing some uh, you know, major cases brought uh, to a, a number of, of nationally recognized uh, sports uh, folks here in, in the country, and people see this. How important is this for us to understand that we are governed by laws in this country? Uh, how important is this for us to back up and say it's important to understand we can't do certain things because there are laws against that. H have we kind of, to some degree, skated by that issue and think, well, maybe this doesn't apply to me, whether you're a sports uh, hero or not? Uh, do we need to kind of reemphasize that? I think so, because, you know, the law is set up as a model, as a guide for all of us. We had to have rules and regulations to live by. We must have those rules and regulations. And we must never lose sight of the fact that these laws were passed by our elected representatives. Mm -hmm. These are people that we elected. And I know they take their jobs very seriously. You've had some representatives, some senators on here. Absolutely. They take their jobs very seriously. And they don't, don't do it in a vacuum either. They are looking at case law. They're looking at other things out there and reaching their decisions about what laws to pass. In addition to that, these laws are applicable to all persons. Mm -hmm not just to one or two, but to everyone equally. And I think people need to always remember that. The reason we have laws is to make sure there's some objective standard out there that says what is right and what is wrong. And um, the laws apply equally to everyone. And just because you don't agree with the law doesn't mean you can necessarily go out and just break that law. The law is what it is. If you don't agree with the law, your job is then to contact your legislator, whoever that may be, Voice your opposition to that law, and maybe there can be some changes made to the law. But it's not upon this person to simply say, I'm not going to follow the law. We've got to, we're a nation of rules and laws. It all starts with the United States Constitution and works its way down. Every state has a constitution. Then on that, we all have statutes, and we've got to live by these laws. Ernie, when we, when we look at what happens in the judiciary, and, and just a general understanding, civic lesson, as, as you just partially explained to us here, when the judiciary speaks on any case, whether it's one you've prosecuted mm -hmm. here in North Carolina, uh, whether it's one in Florida, as in the Zimmerman uh, uh, Martin case, there's there's something the judiciary is saying to the people. That's right. What what specific message did the Martin Zimmerman case speak to the people? You know, I think that again we're a nation of laws. That there is a certain law in the state of Florida, stand your ground law that many people may not agree the way that a law played out in this particular case, but nonetheless, it's still the law. And I still think that people out there need, need to say, even if I don't agree with the decision, it's still the decision. I've got to accept that decision because I can only assume that the case was tried fairly, that, um, that both sides did a good job in the case and represent their respective sides, and that the jurors followed the law as they deemed the law as the judge explained it to them to be and they applied the facts to the law. I think that the message needs to be that even if you don't agree with it, that it is still the law, and we're a nation of laws. Otherwise, we're going to have 300 million people in this nation out there 
with their each with their individual laws. Mm -hmm. We don't. We can't be that way. Otherwise, it would be just disorder. And again, if you don't agree with a particular law, go about it with by contacting your legislature, and they can change the law. And the legislature changes laws all the time. Um, I am certain. I've had cases too where um, where sometimes the uh, jurors reach a decision that people didn't agree with. There have been times I didn't agree, but nonetheless, I still respect the decision of the jury. Mm -hmm. The system still worked. And I have never, ever criticized a juror or a jury once they've come back with a decision. Even if it was not something I wanted, I still respect the process. Because those jurors, I take it, they, they did their very, very best in applying the facts and the law. And that's the way our system is supposed to be. It, the, the case, again, in Florida that we're looking at, do you feel as so... Uh, or do you agree with the observation that maybe this case and some of the other issues that it related to, those other issues need discussing and they may need conversation as well, but the mixing the two together it creates a very volatile pot? I think it does. I think it does. Um, because, you know, a lot of people come with preconceived notions of what they believe in terms of self-defense or defense of others or whatever those things may be. But ultimately, though, I would ask those people to read the law. And the law will tell you the law is the law. And I think a lot of people don't really take the time to read the law. And I get calls all the time uh, throughout this district. People ask me about certain things like, you know, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? And the first thing I'll do is I'll say to them, have you read the law? And if they haven't, I'll send them a copy of it, and then I'll discuss it more with them. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with District Attorney Ernie Lee with the 4th Prosecutorial District, talking about issues related to the statutes and governance of the law. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We should know is on the air. If, uh, if you've missed us today, this is the last segment coming up. If you've missed us today, you can uh, catch us at 7 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on Star Vision Cable Channel 16. We're also uploaded to YouTube. Uh, you can pick us up on that as well. There's a summation of this program in the Samson Weekly newspaper. And, of course, we're always streaming live uh, WCLN 1170 AM. You can uh, just click on your computer there. and There's a little icon. You click on that. We're streaming live on that all over the world. We have District Attorney Ernie Lee with us today. Ernie, thank you for taking time to, to sit down and not, not only talk to, uh, to us, but a huge portion of your constituency out there. And we've talked about a number of, I think, very critical uh, and, and, and almost uh, issues that just need to have light shined on them in an understanding of the basic fundamentals of the process here in the United States. And I think uh, we've done a fairly good job with that to this point. New laws, things that have changed in this legislature. The legislature has just uh, finished up. Uh, we have the, the new laws waiting for the governor's signature, and it appears that most of those, as far as I know, all of them will be signed by the governor. Mm -hmm. There was one law that is uh, now in effect uh, that I think kind of uh, overlays a bit in what we're talking about with the Florida case to some degree, but it's the repeal of the Racial Justice Act. Right. What, what is the Racial Justice Act? Why was there a need to repeal it, uh, and how do you see that affecting uh, the process going forward in the judiciary? Well, the Racial Justice Act uh, was passed a few sessions ago by the North Carolina General Assembly, and what it did was it said that in every capital case, that means either pr people currently on death row, and there's about 152 people on death row at this time, as well as any pending cases that the defense could use statistics to show that it was racial discrimination in a case, and therefore, if there's any type of statistical information out there in any case, anywhere in the state of North Carolina at any time, that uh, the person would not be eligible for the death penalty. And uh, as you can tell, it's such an overbroad thing, because why should a case in Sampson County, where someone's been placed on death row, why should it be affected by something that may have happened in Durham? Now, I'm just picking that as an example. Or Boone, North Carolina or you know, any other place, or Charlotte. I mean, why should something that happened out there have some adverse effect upon a case in Sampson County? It shouldn't, because I thought what it did was undermine the jury system again. Because, again, in North Carolina, there are already safeguards in effect, in place, to make sure there's no racial discrimination. For example, it's something called uh, the K uh, Kentucky versus Batson, Batson versus Kentucky decision, the United States Supreme Court decision that says that prosecutors cannot use race in terms of picking a jury. 
And the one who makes that call is the trial judge. The judge who's actually listening to the case as you pick the jury. If you, in, in fact, uh, let's say you were to want to exercise a challenge on a minority, the defense can raise an objection at that time. The judge will have a hearing on it to determine whether or not he believes racial discrimination has occurred. So you, you have a lot of things in effect at that time early in the proceedings. Um, and I really thought that uh, the way the Racial Justice Act was written, even though it may have the best intent, it was so overbroad, so general, that it in fact just undermined the jury system, in my opinion. In fact, uh, almost every personal death row filed a, a racial justice uh, motion, including those that were white defendants who killed a white person. They filed motions on the Racial Justice Act claim there's racial discrimination in their cases. I had one like that in Onslow County. I mean, I was having to defend on that, where an individual there in Richlands, North Carolina, white male, killed his white wife and white stepson. Yet he filed a motion on racial discrimination saying that he was racially discriminated against. See, again, it made no sense. It was just so overbroad. And uh, even though all of us as prosecutors, we we want to make sure there's no racial discrimination because I want everything to be treated fairly, everyone to be treated fairly. In fact, there are some cases, when I first hear about the case, I don't know black, white, Hispanic, or whatever because it doesn't make any difference to me throughout these proceedings whatsoever. I can tell you this, that in the cases that I have done, and I've, I've dealt with Hispanic victims, I've dealt with white victims, African American victims, all the tears are the same when they've lost a loved one. It doesn't make any difference to me what race or national origin or anything they are because they're all victims and they all cry the same tears. Well, the legislature finally decided on the Racial Justice Act to repeal it because they determined the beat was just so overbroad. It was basically just doing away with the death penalty, which again undermines the jury system and our laws in the state. We actually have a death penalty law in the state. Twelve jurors in the state, in order to find death, must first of all be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that a first-degree murder occurred. All twelve must agree this first-degree murder. That's the only offense you can get death in the state. Then secondly, the same jury, all twelve, must agree unanimously that death is the appropriate punishment. I mean, you've got to think about it. Twelve people have got to agree to that. That's a strong litmus test when you, when you look at moving it to that level and thinking about it in that dynamic. Absolutely. And, and, and furthermore... In these cases in which these defendants had filed racial justice motions, the vast majority had already been heard by the North Carolina Supreme Court and already found that the a trial was fair. Any racial issues could have been addressed at that point as well. But the Supreme Court has addressed those and said there were fair trials. At the time this happened, there were six people in death row from, uh, from my district, um, three from Sampson, three from Onslow. Um, all six had gone to the North Carolina Supreme Court had already been heard by the appellate courts. All six have been deemed to be, have received fair trials, yet all six filed motions. I've been dealing with these motions ever since they were filed. And at this point, uh, I can tell you that I've been in touch with the Attorney General's office and uh, we've been making motions to dismiss the racial justice motions that were filed in these cases in light of, uh, light of the uh, repeal of the act. Again, I just think that it was just one of those things that's really trying to do away with the death penalty. Uh, Darnie, I want, to get, I want to get your opinion on a couple other uh, cases, sure. and, and this one, one is a, a law that uh, obviously appears going to pass, the governor's going to sign it, uh, and the other it deals with something that's been going on for some time, and, and uh, just kind of an observation from where you sit. The voter ID law mm -hmm. itself is, is going into play. Uh, the other one is immigration and all the statutes that relate to that on a federal level. There are those who say immigration, we don't really uh, ha need to have any more laws. We've got enough laws as it relates to that. We just need to deal with the acceptance of, of folks that are here and work out a policy to, to get them in place. Let's start with voter ID. Just passed. Uh, you go to the polls and vote. My understanding now from the statute, you got to have a, a picture ID proving who you are by picture and validating your presence. Wh wh where do you stand on that and what's your sense of that as a law now rather than just an observation? I don't have a problem with voter identification as long as it be done fairly which means how about those persons out there that don't actually have uh, any type of identification mm -hmm. because they don't drive 
um, or no photo ID is what you need. Yeah, exactly. So therefore, as long as there's a mechanism in place in the state of North Carolina which would provide that person who may not have the means or just not have a vehicle or not need to drive, make sure they get some type of identification. That's what I'd want because there are going to be those people out there who don't have the means to go purchase any type of identification on their own. So I want to make sure that uh, it can be fairly implemented because, um, uh, you know, I can understand the, the rationale for the law. You want to make sure only people are voting that are actually citizens of the state because that's the way it's supposed to be. Over the age of 18, the citizens of the state. But I also want to make sure that people are not denied the right to vote, right to vote, just because they don't have some type of voter ID unless the state will provide that voter ID for them. And a lot of folks don't see that as something the district attorney should be concerned about. The district attorney should be concerned about it because oftentimes it, it goes into what we call chain of events. You know, in law enforcement, we look at chain of events. Somebody goes to the polls, they can't vote, they get upset, they get irritated, they get five or six more people, they go back to the polls, and all of a sudden you've got other uh, criminal law that goes into play, such as assault, uh, right. all kinds of things that can occur in chaos, and it ends up in a courtroom. So, Yeah, and absolutely, uh, and also sometimes the, uh, the election laws, uh, if there's some type of violation of election law, the Board of Elections will call for an investigation generally done by the State Bureau of Investigation. Well, who do you think they generally go to at some point? Back, the DA's office. Back to the district attorney. So, yeah. so it's important that folks understand how this process works. <coughs> immigration laws. Uh, we, we've got a, a huge, everybody seems to agree, we've got an immigration issue in this country and we've got a lot of laws that are currently being violated uh, and that something needs to be done. I, I, certainly, you know, you and I are not going to deal, uh, address this and, and, and come up with a solution because the Congress of the United States simply can't do it. Right. So, but what, how does that affect the district attorney and how does it affect your job uh, when all this is going on? Well, it does affect my job in this way. Um, uh, there's, there's so many laws out there. Whether or not they're actually being absolutely enforced, I don't know. But I, and the way it does affect the, uh, the DA's offices is, is I have to deal with immigration a lot. Mm -hmm. because I have Sampson County, I have Duplin County, two counties that have a large number of people here, many of which are not legal, some of which are not legal, I should say. And I have to deal with that um, because ultimately if that person then commits a crime, I then have to prosecute that person. Then not only do I have to deal with the prosecution of that particular crime, then I'm also my office has to be in contact with the federal authorities about deportation. Mm -hmm. It takes a considerable amount of time. Generally, what I'll end up doing is having to contact Atlanta ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. I'll in, in, contact them, um, let them know we, we have an individual in our jail, one of our jails, either Duplin Sampson, Alan Lower Jones, has been charged with a criminal offense. We have evidence to believe they're not a, uh, a, a citizen of the United States. They may be here illegally. Therefore, we need for you all to handle that end. Uh, it does add a lot of work to my, my job, uh, quite a bit, because... Um, you know, every case then, it just means extra manpower in trying to coordinate with the federal authorities to make sure this person is dealt with once they've been prosecuted by my office. I've got several of those cases pending right now. And, of course, there's a lot of uh, laws that are, are not reported <coughs> simply because folks don't want to violate the fact that, that they don't have uh, citizenship here, so these, these laws go unprosecuted. Oh, that's it. A lot of people are just hesitant to report which is heartbreaking to the extent you may have a victim out there who's been uh, victimized, yet they're afraid to report the case because they're not a legal citizen. And that's heartbreaking because this person's probably going to end up being a victim again and again. All right, we'll give you a thank you again for being here. Give you about 15 seconds. going to give you more than that, about 15 seconds for a wrap up. I tell you what, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's a great show because I think one of the things out there, we want to try to keep the public informed. I think this is one way of doing it. We talked about the laws out there and things out there, but really this is one avenue where people can truly be informed about the criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been listening to Ernie Lee, District Attorney for Fourth Prosecutorial District. We look forward to seeing you again next week on the radio for more from We Should Know. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question or comment regarding this or any episode, please send your email questions and or comments to jwsimmonsedu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday afternoon beginning at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.